thank you all for joining us in what promises to be a very rich discussion on an essential question for all policymakers, that of making inclusive choices under tight budgets. Social and economic inequalities, which were already in place before the COVID-19 pandemic, have widened. The pandemic also exposed vulnerabilities and inequities in various dimensions, evidencing the need for reforms, including stronger safety nets and improved health care and education services. Not addressing this could lead to persistent incomes gap and social tension. At the same time, policymakers also face limited public space with deteriorated public finances and higher debt. Fiscal consolidation in that supports inclusive policies will be key. The important question is around how it is done. We are facing several shocks, the pandemic, Russia's war in Ukraine, all contributing to a cost of leasing crisis, especially higher food and energy prices tightening financial conditions to lower inflation will have an impact on the population. Therefore, as countries deal with this crisis, policymakers will need to strike a careful balance between ensuring economic and so social sustainability simultaneously. Raising growth with productivity enhancing reforms is essential to reaching this goal. Despite the mounting challenges and rising risks, the countries can still take steps to make their economies more resilient and more importantly, to transform their economies and their institutions to be more equitable and inclusive. Whether governments are investing in education, health, infrastructure, or social safety nets, they will face difficult policy choice in how to finance these crucial expenditures. An open dialogue between policymakers and people will be essential as governments re-examine public support for social policies. To kickstart these discussions, today's seminar will focus on questions around policy options to safeguard public finances and the role that the global contacts can play in setting policies priorities. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ilhan, and uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Raj Kumar. I'm the president and editor-in-chief of DevX, and I am delighted to be with all of you. I must say, if I weren't up here on stage, I would be with you in the audience or following along online, because I think this is the core session of this year's annual meeting. I think this is the core issue if it were a movie, this would be the moment when you see the tsunami in the distance and we're all looking to the hero to see, will he or she save us? You know, can we get out of this dilemma that we're in? Ilhan just very eloquently described the series of interlocking, overlapping challenges. And the question is, what do we do about that? When we know prices are high, I was just in West Africa a couple of weeks ago and What's everyone talking about? Prices. I get back here to the United States. What's everyone talking about? Prices. Um, everyone is facing a global set of challenges that this year's annual meetings have certainly elevated. And the question is, what do you do? How do you get out of this? And we're here to talk about, can you have inclusive policies? Can you have a people first approach? At the moment when you're like a firefighter trying to put out a fire, can you think about the future at a moment of crisis? It's a very challenging set of issues, and we're going to get into it today with an excellent panel and have a really open conversation uh, that I think we'll all learn from. I want to first mention who we have here. Uh, Antoinette Saya is, of course, the Deputy Managing Director of the IMF. Thank you for having us here. We have uh, next to her, we have uh, Gonzalo Hernandez Jimenez, who is the Vice Minister of Finance from Colombia. Welcome. Nice to see you, Gonzalo. And then virtually joining us from London is Jason Braganza who is the executive director of Afrodad. And I think we'll be seeing him on the screen at some point here. Um, and uh, there he is, there's Jason. 
And I'm delighted to have a chance to talk with all three of you about this. I want to start with you, Antoinette, if I can. So the, the, the theme that we're talking about here is inclusive choices under tight budgets. It's kind of the understatement of the year. <laughs> tight <laughs> budgets, right? Countries are reeling from the pandemic. There's no more fiscal space, to use the terminology of this building. Um, and at the same time, they, they've got you know, massive challenges in fuel prices and food prices, et cetera. Is it even possible? You know, can you have sort of pro-people, inclusive policies at a moment like this? No, thank you very much, uh, uh, Raj, for this opportunity. Uh, a very good morning to everybody, and really happy to see all of you here to talk about what is the hugely uh, important issue for our membership and for us at the fund. Of course, as you say, uh, countries reeling from shock after shock, and uh, in, a, in a context of uh, very strained budgets and needing to make some very difficult choices. Uh, and it is uh, very much the case that uh, they, they, they certainly can manage it, we think. We're optimists, uh, we uh, usually are. Uh, we think there's a, a certainly power to uh, uh, intent and focus and uh, difficult trade-offs, of course. Uh, countries, of course, feeling the brunt of uh, the shocks across uh, the world, but low-income countries uh, and poor households being the most impacted. And in fact, uh, uh, low-income countries, uh, the typical household there spends about 44% of their budget on food, um, and uh, you know, uh, 20, that compares to 28%, say, in uh, uh, emerging markets, and only 16% in advanced economies. So very uh, 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 different challenges there. Low-income countries as well, uh, relative to others, uh, much less fiscal space uh, to use. Uh, so making uh, those uh, choices uh, uh, even more difficult. So what can be done? Uh, well, we think the first and foremost priority has to be uh, reducing inflation, getting it uh, down. Uh, it is, as we know, a significant tax on the poor. Uh, we think uh, that uh, uh, central banks have to remain very focused uh, on um, uh, reining in inflation with, uh, uh, you know, uh, getting their, their monetary policy tightening, uh, say, continuing to do so in a, a more aggressive way to make sure that we don't have a situation in which inflation then uh, uh, threatens, uh, you know, uh, sustainable growth down the road. Uh, so that's, uh, that's certainly a priority. And uh, fiscal policy, of course, uh, has its, its um, uh, own objective of uh, uh, trying to attain fiscal sustainability, but it also has to aid uh, monetary policy in this objective of containing inflation, and it can do so. Um, the reduction in fiscal deficits that uh, many countries around the world already have in their plans uh, needs to proceed. And uh, of course, uh, all this is, uh, uh, you might say, easier said than done. Absolutely, easier said than done, but there are choices there. It is not only about, um, not only about uh, rationalizing expenditure. It is also about uh, prioritizing, uh, reprioritizing spending to make sure that that uh, limited fiscal space is put to the best use. And so looking at the expenditures uh, to make sure uh, we're uh, privileging uh, uh, spending that mitigates the impact of uh, uh, reforms on the poor is, uh, is very important. So social safety nets and spending uh, to make sure that uh, uh, cash transfers and other ways of uh, supporting uh, poor segments of the population proceeds is, is certainly uh, uh, very important uh, to, to, to take forward. And that, that's a somewhat new theme, yeah. if I can say. Mm. Um, you know, we at DevX cover global development, and I would, to be honest, we normally would cover the World Bank side of the annual meetings. Mm. But the IMF has become much more central as people in this building are talking more and more about things like social safety nets, not something you often would hear. You would hear the first part of your statement, mm -hmm. getting the fiscal house in order. But how are they linked? You know, why not just deal with inflation, get the fiscal house in order, worry about the social safety nets later? Well, why is it important to, to do it now? Because uh, to, to take reforms forward, you need the support of uh, the population to do so. If you risk, of course, uh, eliciting social, uh, uh, social disturbances, and social protests, as we've seen across a number of countries, without uh, properly onboarding uh, uh, vulnerable segments of the population and getting their ownership, 
and making sure that uh, they are uh, helped to transition this very difficult period is likely to mean that you get stalled in your efforts to take forward reforms. And uh, in addition to social safety nets, of course, uh, and the fund has always very much focused on the need to, cont uh, to retain and to maintain safeguard social spending in order to, uh, to safeguard the investments in human capital that are at jeopardy otherwise. And so that is a huge, uh, hugely important priority, not, not uh, to contain so, uh, social protests, but to make for better growth down the road as well. So that's hugely important also. Let's bring yeah. the vice minister in, if we can, on this point. Because uh, when she talks about social protests, I, I was in Colombia, I think it was May of 21. So just, you know, not long ago. And uh, many of you followed the, the news there where there was a tax reform attempted by a prior government and you saw people in the streets and including in the city of Cali where there was a long standing protest. So, you know, I think what the deputy managing director is saying rings I'm sure very personal and true to you that you have to really manage uh, this moment both from a finance standpoint but also from the human side of the question, right? How do you really make sure the population is with you? Now you're a new government and you are one of the main pillars of this new government is a major tax reform. So how are you thinking about managing a major tax reform? Again, just when a year and a half ago that led to protests and doing it in a way that brings the population along. Take us through your thinking. Yeah, before, before going to the specifics of the Colombian situation, uh, I want to start saying that, uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me here and this opportunity to, to share some thoughts and ideas about uh, Colombia and what we are doing in terms of expanding the, the fiscal space to, to deliver the, the, the society's mandate in terms of improving social conditions in, in a developing economy, in this case in Colombia. But I want to start saying that uh, we are very happy with uh, the IMF and other institutions recognizing uh, some elements that are central elements in having societies with economic growth, sustainability, and at the same time, more egalitarian societies. This is part of the speech, and uh, as, as, as the climate uh, uh, demands uh, as well. And I think that this is particularly important for developing economies that have, as you said before, less room to implement uh, different policies in order to, to attend uh, people's uh, uh, needs. Uh, in the case of Colombia, the, these demands represent something that at that moment, in 2021, uh, was defined as a street democracy. And, and I would say now, uh, one year after, that if we don't make uh, enough efforts to deal with, the, with, with a stronger democracy, with more, a more legitimate democracy, uh, then uh, we'll have the same type of problems that uh, these societies faced uh, after the pandemic, which reflect not only the problem of the pandemic, but also structural problems in an economy that is very unequal and that is affected by uh, poverty. Uh, the, the intensity of poverty in Colombia is close to 40 percent. Uh, it increased to 44 percent during the pandemic, and still now we are affected by informality, uh, not enough access to formal labor markets and the possibility for many citizens to contribute to uh, all the initiatives that the, the state should have in order to provide uh, more goods and services. So um, in particular now with this new government, we, we know that there is a change that is demanded. It cannot be a shallow change. It has to be a serious change. And how do you do it with this uh, fiscal uh, tightness uh, that is also conditioned by the external conditions in the, in, 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 in the financing of uh, the fiscal spending in many developing economies. Uh, and this is why a key element of the economic agenda in Colombia is the tax reform, which was presented the first day of the government. Uh, and this is not only symbolic in terms of saying this is a key element of the agenda, but also because we really require more revenues in order to uh, have uh, the, the possibility to finance the, the fiscal spending in terms of physical and social uh, infrastructure. And this tax reform uh, is 
is the, the proposal is is close to 1.5 percent of the GDP. So That's it's a it's a very ambitious tax reform, uh, and of course we are going to talk more uh, about about the particular elements of the tax reform. But this is this is a, a probably the the key aspect that I would mention in order to say uh, facing this. Uh, narrow fiscal space, we need to expand it in order to attend uh, policies for people. Right, this is a key moment in Colombia and in many other countries. I mean, there are many countries here that are currently negotiating with the IMF or working with the World Bank on, on fiscal packages precisely to try to thread this needle, mm -hmm. to increase resources for the poorest people in society, for basic social services, at the same time they shore up their economy. With, with the dollar strength, you know, rocketing forward, currencies in flux. It's a really challenging moment. And maybe, Jason, I can bring you into this discussion because, at least to me, maybe the most analogous period we've seen was about a decade ago with uh, the food crisis. You know, right after the global financial crisis, food prices around the world went up, and the Arab Spring happened at that time, and there were protests around the world. And protests have already come up in our first two sets of comments here. Jason, you work a lot with civil society. I'd love to get your sense of where is the role of civil society here, and is there a way to thread this needle? Will, will we, do you think we're going to see widespread protests around the world as a result of the moment we're in, or do you think there is a way for policymakers to actually find some common ground here? Raj, um, thank you very much for that question. And uh, also just let me extend a, a gratitude of thanks to the IMF for inviting civil society organizations uh, to be part of this session. Um, before I respond, uh, just to, for the purpose of the audiences, AfroDad stands for the African Forum and Network on Debt and Development. Uh, we're a Pan-African civil society organization headquartered in Harare in Zimbabwe. Um, I think Maybe to tackle your question, Raj, uh, now, I mean, I, I'll probably look at the perspective of the role of young people in this um, and, and across the divide and, and particularly focus on the African continent. And one of the things that this Christ, these multiple crises are beginning to show is that the demographic dividend that many of us have assumed would uh, be the transformative a catalyst for the continent is likely to be missed. Um, and, and a lot of this is uh, predicated, you know, on the deep and long impacts of, of COVID-19. I think when you look at um, the impact of COVID-19 on educational attainment, uh, many schools, school closures, you know, have had and will continue to have a very uh, deep impact on the educational outcomes and attainment um, on the continent. Uh, you know, and within that, you do have um, a segmented impact where probably the girl child together with um, those with special needs and disabilities are likely to, you know, fall slightly behind. Um, and all of these are, are sort of coupled and, and, and deepen the kind of challenges that policymakers are likely to be facing um, in this period of multiple crises um, that both um, uh, Mr. Jimenez and, and uh, Ms. Saye have mentioned in terms of how do you then deal with this um, concoction of, of, of challenges. I think the second point around, you know, uh, the demographic dividend uh, being affected and, and potential rise for um, social unrest is to do with the fourth industrial revolution um, on the continent in Africa specifically, and the extent to which um, young people who have, again, been at the center of taking advantage um, of technological um, uh, advancements, the increased inter access to internet and, and, and technology, whether this is going to be affected by the current uh, multiple crisis and, 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 uh, and how then policy making is being done um, on the continent. And I think the, the common thread through this and is, of course, the debt, uh, increasingly uh, debt crisis that is affecting the continent and the broader developing uh, regions. The, the idea that, you know, governments are now in a very difficult position of having to trade off, and I think Ms. Saye mentioned this in her opening remarks, that there is a trade off now between uh, debt servicing in order to keep and appease uh, creditors versus, you know, investments in social protection schemes, um, education, uh, food security, and, and so on. And so I, I do think that 
um, the issue of uh, the debt, unsustainable levels of debt are becoming a significant problem. And so when you think about how social unrest might start be, you know, start evolving or erupting in different parts of the world, um, people will start seeing, uh, you know, creditors outside of, of their regions or outside of their, their borders receiving money that they ought to be, uh, they ought to be having invested in them in, in the form of public services. I think the other point really is around the, the paradigm and, and the paradigm in which we are thinking through about uh, solutions. The fiscal consolidation programs that many African countries are uh, embarking on and are negotiating um, in Washington this week and probably ahead of this week and, and, and beyond, um, many of them are also having to you know, make very serious decisions on whether they can continue to invest in social uh, protection programs, cash transfers that have that have been mentioned, but at the same time, where is the revenue coming for this? Um, a, a lot of the advice, historically and presently, um, you know, tends to be on the VAT side, so value addition taxes, which again we know, uh, whilst they raise revenue, they do have uh, knock-on effects on on citizens and invariably young people, particularly on on the African continent, when we're when we're talking about. Um, taking advantage of the demographic dividend. So I do think that, you know, we are caught in a very difficult position. And as civil society organizations, one of the things is to find out or to, you know, create the space for continued investments away from uh, fiscal consolidation programs into things like education, food, uh, water and sanitation, and to ensure that we do not lose out on the two or three years in the education attainment levels that were hindered due to COVID-19 and, and the school closures. I think the other point is to think about how do we create um, a domestic revenue or resource mobilization agenda that does not uh, prioritize debt servicing uh, and over, over investments in social services and public services. I think this is one of the most important aspects of how we get out of this crisis um, and these multiple crises. I think the the current idea where debt servicing and creditors are being prioritized, I think, is perhaps um, a, a very challenging moment and, and perhaps where, you know, citizens will start uh, getting very upset that, you know, uh, public resources are being or taxpayers resources are being used to pay creditors as opposed to invest in social protection programs and cash transfer schemes that, that would protect um, the most vulnerable from the the increasing price crisis that you that you very eloquently uh, presented in your in your opening remarks, and I think you know the analogy that you used in terms of the tsunami in the movie. I think the tsunami has hit us. I think it's more about how do we deal with the fallout, uh, and 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 how can we move forward in terms of um, also rethinking the the paradigm in which the the, the, the solutions to some of these problems are, are likely to be found. Jason, I'm going to come back to you in a little while to talk a little bit more about some of those solutions. But just very briefly, you have your finger on the pulse of many young people, youth organizations across the continent of Africa. You know, how fragile is the situation? How likely are we to see protest movements, you know, widespread unrest? Is that, is that an exaggeration at this point? Or what are you, what are you actually seeing? Very briefly. No, absolutely. I don't think it's an exaggeration. I think it's very close. Uh, the, you know, young people have access to information now than more than information that they've ever had before. And they can see the opportunities uh, slowly slip away from their grasp because of uh, the impacts of COVID, because of the prioritization of debt servicing over investments in their future. Um, and they, too, are going to be saddled with uh, some of these debt repayments. We're going to come back to this theme, but I want to bring Antoinette into the discussion because one of the things Jason described was a challenge in terms of the IMF's own negotiations right now with countries where uh, he feels you might be thinking about fiscal consolidation first and things like cash transfer, social safety net second. How do you bridge that divide? How do you think about dealing with the short-term crisis? I mean, you don't want to see countries, for example, be in a situation where no one will buy their bonds. Right? or where it's much more expensive for them to, to pay interest on debt. At the same time, you do want to pursue things like education that are more long-term structural issues. You're not going to solve education next week. Hmm. How do you think about that tension, and is his concern a, a valid one, that maybe you're prioritizing the short-term 
and losing some of the opportunities that could be here in the long term. No, I think he's raised uh, some very important uh, uh, issues uh, that are very much uh, front and center, uh, uh, certainly in our work with our member countries, uh, working towards more inclusive fiscal consolidation. And uh, uh, in that context, I mean, it's all about making more fiscal space, right, uh, to allow countries to invest in these hugely important areas uh, of human capital development, of uh, roads, basic infrastructure, all of, all of the things that make for more robust growth down the road. And to do that, uh, countries, many countries, and countries who are at, at high risk of debt distress, uh, in debt distress, clearly need debt relief. There's no question about that. And we've been very much uh, working with countries and with the creditor community uh, to, to, to make sure that efforts uh, uh, that uh, warrant support from the international community because the country itself is making its best efforts to mobilize the revenues it can, but those revenues are still insufficient uh, to actually address the issues it needs to address. It clearly needs debt relief. And uh, getting the common framework, there was a, a discussion of the, uh, the debt yesterday, uh, getting the common framework uh, to move faster than it has been is, is certainly a focus of, of our efforts uh, that we've been investing in as well. Um, and, uh, you know, finding ways for middle-income countries who are not uh, uh, beneficiaries of the common framework yet to also have a more coordinated approach to their debt uh, uh, issues and their debt relief that they need. And this is all but, made much more complicated yeah. by the realities of currency fluctuations, right? Well, I, it, I mean, for, for countries who have uh, uh, the, the bulk of their debt in dollars, that uh, clearly uh, a more difficult, uh, and uh, with the tightening in the financial uh, uh, markets uh, for many countries, not able to, to draw on new resources there. I, I but, there, uh, you know, I wanted to also yeah. say before I finish, of course, that uh, countries also have to do their part. And there are huge uh, uh, areas for doing better, just enforcing existing taxes. Right. Strengthening tax administration so that everybody and making uh, uh, taxes, um, uh, you know, people who are not paying, pay their fair share. That is important. That does not require a new tax. It just requires getting that uh, tax administration help that we can provide to strengthen tax administration and to making people pay when they can. Mm -hmm. But it also means, and the um, minister was talking about uh, the tax uh, efforts in, in Colombia, it also means a more progressive approach to tax policy. Yes. Uh, you know, uh, uh, income taxes, make them more progressive. Property taxes, mobilize the potential that there is in property taxes. Make sure that you're uh, taxing profitable multilateral, multinationals uh, who can pay, do their part and pay. You know, all of those issues making tax uh, mobilization, revenue mobilization more progressive countries can do more in that sphere. Yeah, there's of course a big political economy question around how to do that, yeah. uh, because it's yeah. not as and though there won't look be at resistance. The spending side. Look at the spending side also. Don't keep you know, building white elephants, for example. You know, there are, there are room in some budgets to do better and to reallocate those resources to, to true priorities. So countries have to also look at their spending side. But uh, there's a lot on the revenue side that have not uh, has not been uh, actually, you know, uh, pursued, and yeah. that can be. Yeah. And in some countries, it's, it might seem easier to just expand the government because you know you can provide jobs that way. But if you have an inefficient, bloated public sector, then how do you make sure the private sector can grow? You wanted to jump in yeah, on some actually, of these I was, points. Gonzalo, I was going to say that this uh, fiscal dilemma is not faced by, as we economists uh, say with a corner solution, right? Like uh, sacrificing uh, the, the fiscal consolidation and attending the social needs. Like we need to find a, a clear balance with all these objectives. And this is why uh, tax reforms in this, in this moment are important, but not only the general concept of the tax reform, but also the way uh, in, in which this tax, uh, tax reform is implemented. And, and it has to be more progressive, as, as it is the case in the proposal that the Colombian government uh, has presented to the Congress. And another element that you probably uh, don't know is that 50% of the revenues are coming from oil and mining, which is also that is, uh, this element is also consistent with the uh, energy transition that the, the, the government is 
looking for in, in, in Colombia, right? So on one hand, you have the fiscal consolidation, and let's also remember that in Colombia we have a fiscal rule, uh, which is yeah. uh, part of the law. In, in, so it's, it's a serious institutional element in the fiscal consolidation uh, dimension. Uh, but at the same time, we have a medium-term uh, fiscal framework that defines the policies for the next 10 years. And so the government has to respect these, these limits. And at the same time, we have the, the social demands. So everything you can imagine is a complete puzzle with many pieces that you have to put together. And this is why we, define, we, we decided to have this tax reform with these elements of progressiveness and also uh, having some types of taxes that could be associated with windfall taxes. In, in, in the sense of oil and mining willing to contribute more uh, in terms of the revenue that we are looking for. Hey, you're in an unusual situation in that half of your revenues, as you said, come from fossil fuels and from mining. It's a big advantage in a way when world prices are going up for those commodities and they're priced in dollars for the most part. Mm -hmm. But wh why then is the challenge so significant in Colombia? Well, why then, given that you have this opportunity around these resources, it does seem as though this tidal wave, as I described it, is hitting every country, almost regardless of their circumstance, that there's a, a, a global withdrawal from, of, of capital from middle-income countries, from low-income countries, and, and maybe you're caught in that wave. How, how do you describe the situation you're in? Yeah, I would say that the equation is, is even more complex. Uh, for example, Ecopetrol, which is uh, one of the most important uh, firms in Colombia, uh, specialized in oil production and, and exports, uh, has also some uh, elements that are very uh, welcomed in, in the sense of the energy transition. So, of course, you need to, to, to level the, all, all these, all, all these uh, objectives and, and the tax reform cannot go that uh, farther uh, in terms of revenues that you are getting from these sectors because you also need them uh, to, to invest in in these new technologies and innovation in terms of the energy transition. As you said before, uh, the balance is also uh, related to uh, having a good combination of the state role and also the private sector role in creating employment. Uh, this, is, this is good for the policies for people that, that we need in our developing economies. Yeah, is there a chance that by trying to do this progressive tax reform, where you're really trying to redistribute in a way, right? The taxes are mostly going to hit upper income people, elites in the country who historically have not paid as much in tax. And then you're going to try to redistribute that through social safety nets, through education programs, healthcare programs. At the same time that there's a recession, maybe a global recession coming, according to the IMF, right? We're seeing a big slowdown around the world. Is there a chance that that might actually tip a country like Colombia into a worse circumstance that actually hurts poor people more? than otherwise. Does that worry you as an economist, as somebody who thinks about these issues very deeply? Yeah, there are, there are some, some, some elements I want to mention. The first one, uh, a macroeconomic element of the balanced uh, budget. Like we know that this has a short-run positive macroeconomic effects, uh, but it also depends on the type of expenditure that you have. And if you invest in more phys uh, social and physical infrastructure, that's good. When, when I say social infrastructure, I mean uh, care economics, I, I, I mean uh, accumulation of human capital, uh, more health. All, all, these, all these variables are good for economic growth in the, in the long run uh, as well. And another element that we uh, have uh, observed in, in our estimations uh, is, is, also, is, also, is also based on macroeconomic issues that the marginal propensity to consume uh, of poorer people is higher than the marginal propensity of consume uh, uh, of richer people, so this distribution also helps to to activate consumption in some sectors. That so it's kind of like a stimulus to the economy in a way during a recessionary yeah. moment. Yeah, of course we are not going to say that that the the, the the short run effect of the tax reform is to boost uh, the economic activity uh, per se, but but there are some mechanisms that that we want to highlight that could foster uh, at least to 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 be consistent with with the with the strategies that the government has in order to have a, a, a more dynamic economy, uh, especially knowing that the next year or even the last quarter of this year is going to be difficult in, 
in the international uh, economy, right? And, and, and Colombia is, a, is a, an open economy, very dependent on uh, what's happening in the rest of the world. 50% uh, of our exports are oil and coal, and the prices are not defined in Colombia, but in the international markets. What happens with the international interest rates also conditions the monetary policy in Colombia. So this is why all these elements, uh, as I said before, uh, are like a big puzzle uh, with many pieces that we have to put together. Right, it's like a, a wicked problem. You press and try to solve in one place and it, it gets worse than another. Jason, I, I wanna get your take on this because a lot of this sounds really good, but I can imagine a youth organization, a civil society organization being skeptical and saying, well, look, the fact is we have laws on the books for, let's say, tax right. that aren't even enforced today because there are elites who can get around them. That's right. So how do we know that a new tax regime in Colombia or in another country, how do we know that a new approach to fiscal consolidation in, in any middle-income or low-income country won't just lead to the same kind of inequalities that we've seen in society, won't just lead to a lack of transparency, to corruption, to elites taking the, the benefit. How do you, are, are there tools that you see as a civil society leader to increase the transparency, the accountability, that can actually bring society behind these reforms and reduce that skepticism? What's your take on this, Jason? Yeah, thanks a lot. I mean, maybe I'll just start with the idea that, you know, perhaps it's about the paradigm. Um, the paradigm in which we're trying to find um, solutions to some of these problems. Um, perhaps the, par the paradigm that is creating these uh, problems is, is really what needs to shift. The, the thinking that, um, for example, in the context of uh, the, the infrastructure investments that Ms. Sae was talking about, physical infrastructure here, I mean, um, must be funded or financed, you know, largely through debt finance. Um, is, is that really something that we should be doing? Uh, particularly when the, the volumes and values are, are in dollar terms are very high. Um, they have very long repayment periods, but also very long uh, recovery periods in terms of generating and stimulating revenue, which then can be used and redirected um, to other forms. So I think there's also that political conversation that needs to be um, had around, you know, what is the correct paradigm, the right political economy uh, uh, mechanism that we need to use uh, to find some of these solutions. Um, I, I welcome very much what both Mr. Jimenez and uh, Ms. Sae are saying about tax reform. I think civil society organizations have for a very long time uh, been uh, singing from this hymn sheet around tax reforms, about multinational corporations uh, paying their fair shares in the countries where they have their operations and not using very complicated and convoluted tax uh, avoiding and tax evading um, structures to move the move their uh, profits out of developing countries into tax havens um, in in the global north. So I do think also tightening that and and you know it's very nice to hear the IMF using that kind of language because we have been um, doing a lot of advocacy around this for for several for several years now. Um, I do think that you know in addition to the 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 instruments or the tools that Mr. Jimenez has been talking about. Um, there is, I think, an argument in the context of perhaps uh, the African continent where, you know, you may want to think about um, investing in the social infrastructure, hospitals, schools, clean water and sanitation, um, because these have longer term impacts uh, in terms of, you know, what growth and development might look like in, 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 uh, and on the continent. I think the other point really is to really think through the, the model around financing. And as, as I started, you know, responding to the second question, the idea that, you know, debt finance is, is, is front and center of transforming the African continent, I think is one that needs to be rethought and, and rethought very carefully because the debt landscape in itself is providing a lot of complexity to, to the indebtedness and the unsustainable debt that many African countries uh, specifically and developing countries more generally are facing. You have a lot more non-traditional creditors. You have a huge influx of private and commercial creditors, uh, which just makes the creditor landscape very difficult when you're trying to negotiate and create uh, fiscal space uh, when dealing with uh, debt servicing issues. Um, with regard to transparency, accountability, and governance, I think 
there is a case where you know uh, citizens need to be involved a lot more in the consultative process where governments are engaging in uh, budget making in fiscal policy development, um, in debt contraction, in tax policy, um, and so on. I do think that, you know, specifically when dealing with debt issues or debt contraction, there also needs to be fair amount of transparency, accountability, and governance um, from both sides, both the creditors as well as the borrowers. I think hitherto, a lot of emphasis has been placed on borrowing countries um, and sometimes even labeled as irresponsible borrowing. I do think there is a case and there are arguments where we can talk about irresponsible lending, where, you know, creditors can see that the debt uh, sustainability indicators for, for many developing countries are reaching the tipping point or there is going to be a risk of, of uh, struggling in the future, but still continue to lend. Um, I also think there, is, there, there has to be a bit more analysis on whether borrowing uh, to repay current uh, debts and, and existing creditors is the right way. Um, is there an opportunity right now, uh, as we stand with these, with this tidal wave that's that's hit us, uh, to really sit down and relook at the debt burdens that many African governments are facing and developing countries at large are facing, and and start thinking, um, are we ready for? A, you know, is the IMF, is the global financial architecture ready uh, for a series of uh, defaults? Um, is it ready for having to deal with, with, the, with the complexity that comes with that? So I do think there's a, there's a huge role of, you know, for everybody to be involved in the transparency, accountability and governance agenda. Um, but starting very much with it being centered around people, around young, young youth organizations, because they too will bear the brunt, um, as well as the creditors, where there's has been very little emphasis on their contribution and their ability in being uh, transparent and accountable for the way they do uh, their transactions in, in developing countries. Uh, Antoinette, I feel like we're coming full circle in a way to where we started from Jason's comments, which is he's saying, look, there's an elephant in the room, mm. and that elephant is a looming debt crisis. Mm. Countries are not going to be able to pay back their debt. It's unsustainable. And here we are talking about cash transfers. We're talking about social safety nets. Aren't all of those things going to become sacrificed any minute now if we land in this situation? And is there really some way to address both things at the same time, to shore up the fiscal situation so the debt is not unsustainable? And really, at the same time, we're going to do larger cash transfer programs, more redistribution. Can it really happen now? Well, it, it is true that we are in a shock-prone world, and uh, in that context that countries uh, uh, need to uh, think in a more uh, precautionary fashion mm -hmm. in terms of uh, how to make for uh, more resilient uh, uh, you know, uh, systems, uh, fiscal systems in, in their countries to be able to withstand the shocks that, that we can't fully anticipate. And uh, for sure, uh, they will need to, as I was saying before, uh, make more fiscal space. Uh, it's not just on, on the revenue side, it's strengthening public financial management, making those more transparent so that citizens are indeed convinced that the resources they're being asked to pay, pay is going to be used appropriately. Uh, there has to be trust in, in what governments will do with these uh, new revenues. And uh, even uh, you know, when you look at revenues, uh, the, the, the value-added tax, which is a huge, uh, has very high potential, as we know, has some issues in terms of uh, progressivity that you need to, to address. But you just don't look at the, the revenue side. Look at how the revenue is spent. And together, if there are possibilities of making more revenues from the VAT uh, in the short run, why not exploit those and use them appropriately on, on good expenditure? And that's, that's looking at the totality of the fiscal side, not just one or another, right, so, so the VAT, to know what the ultimate progressivity is of, of a tax or a, So uh, the VAT itself yeah. might be a regressive tax. It might hit the poorest hardest, but as long as the resources are being redirected to them, right, you're, you're you using it for it. social safety nets, you can find a way to make that ultimately benefit. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I, I know that uh, he talked a lot about uh, the debt issue, which is uh, very important. Uh, and we're, we're all focused on the debt issue. Uh, but we're, you know, we're trying to also focus in this session also on what countries themselves can do. And uh, they will need help. There's no question about it. They need debt relief. Many countries do. 
but in order for that debt relief to, to be impactful, to make any difference to development, they have to also address these very difficult issues in terms of vested interests not wanting them to address them, mm -hmm. right? They have to be addressed. As structural uh, issues on the fiscal side have to be addressed, better governance, more transparency in how you spend all of those without debt relief, you know, I don't want to call uh, uh, name countries, but I, I know of some uh, that have gotten debt relief and have absolutely just uh, fla flaunted it and spent it, it, squandered, uh, it. squandered it completely. And so there has to be more than just debt relief. Yeah, that's a very provocative and important point that in a way this is a crisis, but you don't want to waste a crisis. Mm -hmm. And maybe the crisis is an opportunity to get to some long range structural issues like in a country like Colombia, where social mobility is I think the lowest in the region, maybe in the world, it's one of the lowest in the world. And can you use this moment as a, as a kind of pressure to say, we have to change the structure now, otherwise when will we? And, and, and this is why although any tax reform is uncomf uncomfortable for governments and even for citizens, this is probably the first case that we uh, don't, on, don't only have uh, the majority in the Congress as, as the government, but also the support of the society is very important. Like there are some surveys that say that 70% of the Colombian citizens approve the tax reform and the type of tax reform that we are uh, fostering in this case. And I think that part of the narrative that we have used is that, of course, all the spending is going to be uh, in terms of redistribution, uh, to orient it to attend the social needs of the poorest people in, in Colombia. This is related to the social mobility you were talking about. And also the way in which the tax reform was structured. Uh, the first element that we use in our communication, which is a key element in the reform, is to mention that uh, people that earn less than uh, 10 million pesos per month, which is uh, 10 times the minimum wage, as, as you said before, uh, won't pay any cent more with this tax reform. And then, as part of the communication, we also said, okay, who is going to pay for tax reform in, in regard uh, to the personal income tax? And two from three additional pesos that we are getting in the, in, the, in the tax reform are going to be paid by people that earn 20 million pesos per month. So that means 20 times the, the minimum wage. And especially if you have into account that the Colombian economy is affected by informality, so many people don't even earn the minimum wage. So you, you can realize that uh, this is really uh, be paid by, by richest people. Of course, you, you mentioned two key audiences for the reform, the, the population of the country, the Congress, a third one is the global investor community. Mm -hmm. That's a hard one as well, right? <laughs> uh, they, it hasn't always been smooth, and you can see the Colombian peso and the challenges it's had. T telling that story to the global investor community, to creditors, is also a key element of these annual meetings, right, and of this, of this message. We're talking a lot about domestic political economy, but there's a global political economy too. And this is why we emphasize that uh, we are not talking here about a corner solution of the fiscal dilemma. So we are respecting the fiscal rule, we are respecting the fiscal consolidation, uh, our level of debt is close to the objective in the fiscal rule, so it's 50% of the GDP, which is relatively high after the pandemic, but is declining and is close to, to what we call the anchor of the, of the, of the debt in the fiscal rule. Uh, we are completely uh, complying with the fiscal rule, which we always say is not only one fiscal rule, but many fiscal rules, because it's about the debt, it's about the fiscal deficit, deficit and also about the, the extra revenues that you get from oil and mining. And, and this is why uh, I think that uh, this, this, these are convincing arguments for, for investors that we are uh, fostering all these uh, initiatives with complete fiscal responsibility. Of course, if there is a recession, and this is, will be the case for Colombia and many other countries probably here at these meetings that have large amounts of revenue from fossil fuels, you might see revenue from oil and gas, from mining go down. 
just at the moment when the fiscal situation is getting worse, right? I mean, this is a reality that many countries will, will have to face. Yeah, yeah. No, I think the minister is making uh, some very important points about, you know, the, the fiscal framework and the need for it to, 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 to have credibility. And uh, I think countries can help themselves uh, ease the, uh, uh, the short-term uh, uh, cost and short-term pain from having a medium-term fiscal uh, uh, framework that uh, says clearly up front to all uh, that uh, a country is going to pursue uh, deficit reduction in the medium uh, term, mm -hmm. and this is how we'll do it, and to, to make sure that, uh, you know, it's a credible strategy, and it can, it, can, it can very much help them to contain cost of borrowing in the short term. It can actually uh, reduce, uh, you know, when, when, a, when a government's budget is really credible and it's assessed by such, uh, by others uh, than government itself, of course, uh, then uh, you can, you can uh, get, gain up to 40 basis points or so uh, in your borrowing uh, from that. So there, there is uh, uh, indeed uh, need for, for more of that, yeah. You brought up the word trust and it is key and when you see the capital flight from many emerging economies, that is a key issue, right? Does the global, yeah. do global capital markets trust these plans, these tax reforms, these fiscal plans? And if they don't, the cost could be enormous to many emerging countries. And if they do, there's much more fiscal space to operate. We're, we're, I'm afraid, running close to the end of our conversation. It's been a really rich discussion. I've enjoyed it a lot. Um, I just thought I'd go to all of you for a final thought. And maybe I'll start with you, Jason. Um, this word trust Antoinette brought up earlier, and we've talked a little bit about the idea of social cohesion. How do you keep society together at a moment that's so challenging like this? Yeah. Jason, just kind of in a rapid fire question, very briefly in a phrase or a sentence, uh, what are you doing, what are organizations you work with doing to try to foster that trust, to try to boost that social cohesion? Thanks. So Three things very quickly. Um, the first one is civil society organizations like Afrodad have come up with two very important documents. One is called the African Borrowing Charter, which is a public document that helps people understand why governments borrow, how they should borrow, who are the stakeholders in, in borrowing, and how to hold uh, government and, and uh, to account when they, when they do their, their debt contraction. Uh, the second one is the Harare Declaration, which talks about um, appreciating the role that the African continent is playing in the global financial architecture and in global economy, and that, you know, the Africa we have today is not the Africa of 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, we're significantly advanced. And so we have this tagline called Africa, the rule maker, not the rule taker. And therefore, we need to be at the table when global rules on, on financial uh, architecture decisions are being made and, and, and being designed. And I think lastly, it's it's you know, action needs to be seen. Um, things like uh, accountability, uh, transparency, and, and good governance across the board, and not just uh, whilst appreciating what Ms. Saya said about um, developing countries and, and governments being held to account and being transparent and following their own laws. I think in the grander scheme of things, if, if people can see also the international community play its role and have trust in international systems and processes, then you know, that's also a very key thing, and that's something we're trying to build uh, with our constituents. Thanks. Thank you, and I, I love that Africa, the rule maker. That's a great, a great line. I'm sure we'll hear more. Uh, Gonzalo, can you, can you give us your final thoughts very, very briefly on this question of trust and social cohesion? Yeah, I was thinking of this phrase that uh, many people mentioned when, when, when I studied my PhD here in the States in 2009, eight, uh, after the financial crisis and the Great Recession and all the, uh, Wall Street uh, against uh, Main Street, you, re you remember all these things 13 years ago, uh, economics for people. And, and that's the priority. But uh, we need to think of the sustainability of this phrase. And economics for people in the short run and the long run requires also to consider this fiscal consolidation and fiscal responsibility. So all these uh, elements uh, in a good balance, I think that uh, are the key uh, structure for having better policies for people. Fantastic, thank you. And your final thoughts? 
You know, uh, for us, of course, uh, helping our members uh, build more trust uh, uh, revolves around helping them to strengthen governance, to improve governance, and uh, to use uh, uh, better public financial management uh, to make uh, their spending processes more transparent, uh, more information more accessible to their population about the budget and how it's been executed. It's hugely important. And uh, so we, we invest uh, quite a bit in that, in a, a lot of the CD that the, the capacity development support from the fund uh, revolves around that. Also on the, on the tax side, of course, uh, making sure that there's transparency uh, there, uh, hugely important. Uh, and that's the only way you can build trust if people know where their money is going and uh, you know, that uh, they feel the impact on their day-to-day -day lives. As without that, uh, you know, governments will just uh, be pursuing, uh, you know, uh, you know, dreams, frankly, in saying that they're going to uh, gain this much revenue from this particular tax because people will find a way not to pay it because they don't trust how it's going to be used. Yeah, that's a great point. If you don't have the people involved, yeah. it doesn't matter how beautifully designed your policy is, yeah. people will go around it. Yeah. And that the fact that we're even having this discussion is in itself kind of a shift in the in the dialogue and the in the dynamic, in the paradigm, right? That here at the World, at the World Bank and IMF annual meetings, you're talking about these issues of how to change policy, even in the middle of a crisis, well, to address these long-term structures. We do change when our world changes around us, yeah. and that's what yeah. uh, we're seeing. And so change is uh, the, the commonality we face today, I yeah. think, and that's what we have to do. I think that's a great point to close us on. I want you to join me in thanking a fantastic panel. Uh, Antoinette Sayed, the Deputy Managing Director of IMF, Jason Brangaza, the Executive Director of AfroDad, and of course, uh, Vice Minister Gonzalo Hernandez, Ministry of Finance in Colombia. Thanks to Thank the moderator. Uh, thank you. Thank you.